just one of the things that um, I've noticed through repeated exposure to Christian missionaries, both at Speaker's Corner and online, is this issue of double standards, this issue of hypocrisy. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean that Christian missionaries were typically, in this particular area of gender relations, relationships between men and women, the roles and functions of men and women in our society and in Islam. And these Christian missionaries will criticize Islam for uh, allegedly having certain views about the role of women and the role of men. And the double standards gets me is because if you actually look in the New Testament, which is their own word of God, you'll see some stuff there which, if it had been in Islam, they would have crucified us about. But what they do is, they, uh, these Christian missionaries, they throw their own Bible under the bus. And I'm not talking about the Old Testament here, which they can always just ignore if they want. I'm talking about the New Testament itself. And I'll, I'll quote from a passage or two in a second. But most Western Christians, this is, this is incredible to believe, but most Western, vast majority of Christians today in the West are secularized, humanist people with just a veneer of Christianity. Because their values really are secular, liberal values, really. They all believe in secular democracy. They all believe in uh, feminism. They may not call it that, but they believe in what the status quo in the West teaches them about relationships between men and women. Um, and so they're basically secular liberals who, who don't really uh, follow their own Bible. So I was going to share with you just a couple of examples of what I mean. So this first quote is from... Uh, a letter that Paul wrote, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, il, uh, 14, verses 34 onwards. Just read what it says and you can make your own mind up. So remember, th th these people are criticizing Islam for having um, bad images of women and bad role models. And I'll come to that in a second, but let's, just, let's be clear first what the New Testament itself says. As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak. They should always be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful, shameful for a woman to speak in a church, in church. And then Paul continues, Anyone who claims to be a prophet or have spiritual powers must acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. Anyone who does not recognize this is not to be recognized. Not to be recognized. Now, this is absolutely clear. Paul is not saying, well, in my opinion, as a first century Roman guy, he is saying this is a commandment of the Lord, that women are not permitted to speak, that they should be subordinate if they want to know anything, ask their husbands at home. And indeed, it is shameful to a woman to speak in church. Okay, so this is the New Testament, good news. So the, these people like Lizzie, the speakers call, and others who, who criticize Islam, this is their, this is their scripture. Does, does it sound very modern and progressive to you? Let me give you another example. So... Let's just go back to that again. Um, what about this particular area of gender relations, relationships between men and women, the roles and functions of men and women in our society and in Islam. And these Christian missionaries will criticize Islam for uh, allegedly having certain views about the role of women and the role of men. And the double standards gets me is because if you actually look in the New Testament, which is there, if it had been in Islam, what they do is they, uh, these, if they want, I'm talking about the New Testament itself. And I'll, I'll quote from a passage or two in a second. But most, but most Western Christians are secularized of Christianity because their values uh, feminism. They may not call it that, about relationships between men and women. So I was going to share with you just a couple of examples of what I mean. So this first quote is from... Uh, a letter that Paul wrote, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, il, uh, 14, verses 34 onwards. Just read what it says and you can make your own mind up. So remember, th th these people are criticizing Islam for having... Um now, if you read, uh, if you look at the context of uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, the book is about order. 
And there were a lot of disorder in the church. There were people being immoral. There were, there were people uh, breaking down the gender roles of man and woman, thinking that they could be men, women could be men, and men could be women, um, uh, etc. So everything was breaking down. People had taken this, we're all one in Christ, and they took it to a point where they, t they were saying, we can live what we want and do what we want. And what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians is, is bringing order, right? Now, so, so that's the first point. That's the context of the whole book. Corinth was known as a, a Greek-speaking place. It was known as a very immoral place. When the gospel got there, it liberated people, and they thought, yeah, this is great, we're going for this. And they thought that the gospel was a license just to do whatever you want and to reject order, right? So that's the first point. That's the context of the book. Second thing is, it talks about liberal democracy and Christians um, being like secular humanists in a way. And I think he's right, there are a lot of Christians that are like that and they're worldly minded. And they need to become more biblical. You need to turn away from what the world is saying, you need to come back to what the Bible's saying. Third point, when it comes to criticizing uh, the Bible, if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter before this chapter, it talks about if you speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. So now faith, hope, and love abide three, but the greatest is love. So Islam doesn't even have this in Islam, in the Quran. There's no passage that can equal Paul's passage on 1 Corinthians 13 about love. No passage at all. So, you know, it, again, it's taking a bit from the Bible, criticizing it, but not looking at its context. So there's about love there. In chapter 14, there, it's very, very clear, it's about order within the church. There was disorder. And the disorder was, um, people were, were not respecting each other. And it's obvious in this context that there were women not respecting the teachers of of the church the elders and the leaders of the church and so there had to be order there and that's the context the context is disorder people are just speaking and babbling in tongues loads of them are just babbling in tongues loads of them are just jumping in and saying whatever they want uh, while the preacher's preaching and paul saying no you can't be doing that when the preacher's preaching if you want to find out about something go and ask your husband at home don't start interrupting the preacher all right and secondly there is a, a respect to the men the men are the leaders in the church primarily and you've got to respect that so that's all that's paul saying uh so and that that's there's nothing wrong in that um now did that, does that mean that women weren't doing things in the church? No, if you read at the end of, of, of Romans, in chapter 16, Paul is writing to lots of women there. Uh, lots of women were around the Lord Jesus serving and, and working with him in mission. Lots of women were with Paul when they were he was doing mission. And if you look at the early church, if you look at the first uh, 100 years of the early church in the second century, women were coming in the ancient world by in droves to Christianity because it was providing freedom for them because they, they were given opportunity to serve and they were serving in many many ways and capacities so you know that's the historical context of the passage and the historical context of early Christianity bad images of women and bad uh, if you want the if you want the historical information if you read uh, Kruger on Crossroads of Christianity the Crossroads of Christianity and it looks at the early church the first, second century and looks at, there's a chapter in there that looks at women in, in the early church that in a second, but let's just let's be clear first what the New Testament itself says as in all the churches of the saints women should be silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak they should always so we've looked at that. To know, let them ask their husbands so we, we, we've looked to that context. The command of the Lord. Anyone who so we've looked at we've looked at that context and the historical context. So let's let's go on now. 
Roman guy. He is saying this is a commandment of the Lord that women are not permitted to speak, that they should be subordinate. If they want to know anything, ask their husbands at home. And indeed, it is shameful to a woman to speak in church. Okay, so this is the New Testament. Yeah, in, in context, in the context of disorder, the, the, they are creating disorder within the church. Just as the people in tongues were creating disorder and there had to be order, that's the context. Good news. So they, these people like Lizzie... Does, does it sound very modern and progressive to you? Like I said, look at the context. Look at Romans chapter 16. Look at the early church. Women were involved in mission. They were on the front line of mission. Women were involved in mission with Jesus. And if you, you know... The the um, the uh, early church in the first, second century was notorious for empowering women, so it's completely uh, against the historical context. What he's saying, his interpretation of the passage. Let me give you another example, and you probably won't believe this unless you already knew this. You won't believe what I'm about to say. Did you know that the New Testament teaches that women will be saved? by having babies. Having babies. You think, how can this be true? Well, you can look it up yourself. I'll just read the passage. It's in 1 Timothy, another letter allegedly by Paul, although most scholars think it's a forgery, for good reasons, actually. But um, it says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse um, 15, women will be saved through childbearing, that's having babies, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. But nevertheless, having babies is absolutely crucial to their salvation. Wow. When did you last hear that preached? Imagine if Islam taught that, you know. Oh my God, women are being so support, subjected and subordinated in Islam. No, what, what he's saying there, it's in the context of women who are uh, wasting their time, women who are gossiping, or whatever. What Paul is saying is, look, if you're obedient, if you follow the Lord, if you're obedient, when you're going through childbearing pain, you'll know comfort and blessing. God will be with you. He will strengthen you. He will help you. But if you're not obedient to him, you don't count on his blessing. That is what it's saying. That's the context of it. I remember being at theological seminary at Nazarene College, and we were doing uh, studies on this. And I remember some theological students smirking and laughing at this passage, which was a disgrace. And uh, if you're going to come at it as a worldly humanist, then, you know, you're not going to find the blessing of the Word of God. But if you come at the Word of God in a humble way and look at things in their context, you will find the answers. Now, what about the Quran? The Quran talks about plow your wives. The Quran talks about you can have concubines. The Quran talks about that you can, uh, you know, so... Muhammad uh, had a young girl. Uh, Muhammad had more than four wives. The Quran says have four wives m maximum. Muhammad had more than four wives. Uh, that's oppression. Uh, so there's no comparison. The Bible says ha only have one wife. So how Paul Williams has the guts and the temerity to attack the New Testament. And then... The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ died for the church, so a husband is to die for his wife. Also, Paul says there is neither Greek nor Gentile. There is neither woman or man. We are all one in Christ. So there is an equality there, but we have different roles. You know, that's what the Bible teaches. It's a, a lot better and more radical and better than the Quran, which is putting women in sex slavery, basically. The other thing as well, is these secular humanists, or Christians who were become humanistic and, and whatever, you know, you need to make your mind up, are you following the Lord Jesus, or are you following yourself, are you following the Word of God, or your own ideas? You follow the Word of God, you will understand the purity of the Word of God, and know it in its context, and it will make sense because they just got to have babies to be acceptable to Allah. But the New Testament itself says that women will be saved by having babies. So those Christian women who are not having babies, their salvation is in doubt. Bible 
nowhere teaches that you were saved by having babies. The word saved there has the idea of saved from childbearing. In other words, the pain of childbearing. If you're obedient, God will be with you in the childbearing. That's the context. So Paul is just looking at things in out of context. You know, I'm not going to name names about the Christian women I know, but most of them don't have babies. They're, you know, are they really saved? Good question. So this is the kind of thing... So I think in, in Islam, one of the beauties of Islam is that the, the, the morality, if you like, the roles, the differences in function between men and women is emphasised. You see, in the West, the relationships between men and women, the differences, I should say, are minimised. Almost as though the men and women are interchangeable, that they are pretty much identical in, in, in who they are. Well, that's what Paul was doing. Paul, in that passage, what he quoted before in 1 Corinthians, he's showing that there is a difference between men and women. But there are also passages that Paul says that men and women are equal. So he's taking passages of Paul to suit his point, but not not uh, looking at passages that give Paul uh, a fuller understanding of what he believed and taught. And then he's actually contradicting himself, Paul, because he's, he's saying, oh, look at what Paul's doing. But we believe that, you know, women and men are different. There are differences. Well, as Paul was emphasising that as well. So he's not actually taken on board what Paul was trying to say in his context. So let's have a look at uh, Let's have a look at what David Wood says. A, B, C of equality with women. So let's have a look. So we've listened to what Paul says. Responsibilities. At the Prophet Muhammad's own beloved first wife, uh, Khadija, was a wealthy, self made entrepreneur. All right, ABC, you've finally managed to tick me off. You just told millions of people that according to Islam, men and women have equal rights and responsibilities before Allah. And what evidence does Ursad Manji give? She says that Khadija was a wealthy, self made entrepreneur. I wonder why Ms. Maji failed to mention the fact that Khadija was a wealthy, self-made entrepreneur before Islam, before she married Muhammad, before Muhammad even began receiving revelations. In other words, if Khadija's social status is evidence of equality between men and women, it would be evidence of equality between men and women in pagan Mecca, before the rise of Islam. But ABC News doesn't tell us any of that. All we get is the misrepresentation. So, why would ABC tell us that men and women are equal in Islam? I suspect it's because they know most people don't have the resources or the time to carefully examine what we see on the news. But I do. Let's take a look at what Islam really teaches about men and women. Surah 434 is always a good place to start. Men are in charge of women. Why? Because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other. By nature, men excel women. And because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are the obedience, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. But what do you do if women get out of line? As for those from whom ye fear rebellion, admonish them and banish them to beds apart and scourge them. Then, if they obey you, seek not a way against them. The Quran is very, very clear. It certainly is, Miss Manji. 
So, men are in charge of women. They're superior to women, they excel women, and if women get out of line, men are commanded to beat them into submission. Sorry, ABC, but this doesn't sound like equality. Nor is there equality when it comes to how many marriage partners a person can have. Surah 4.3 says, And if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry other women of your choice, two or three or four. Yes, you heard that correctly. Muslim men can marry up to four women. Can Muslim women marry up to four men? No. Is this what you call equality, ABC? We should also note that Muslim men can have more sexual partners than just their four wives. Muslim men get to have sex with their war captives and slave girls, those whom their right hands possess. Consider Surah 23, 1-6. The believers must eventually win through. Those who humble themselves in their prayers, who avoid vain talk, who are active in deeds of charity, who abstain from sex, except with those joined to them in the marriage bond, or the captives whom their right hands possess, or in their case they are free from blame. So that's not even a quarter way through the video. Uh, you can look at uh, David Wood, ABC, Equality for woman Islam, okay, and uh, so you can just uh, go to that yourself and uh, Look at the full video, but you get my point that there's no comparison to what Paul Williams is saying Genders they're pretty interchangeable and fluid in Islam the differences are emphasized and they're celebrated so for example a, a woman's primary jurisdiction is over the home which is the centre of the family, where she looks after the children, she looks after uh, the house, and so on. And the man goes out and fights in the world, has, has the job that is difficult, earns the money, has to put up with his employer. Um, so the roles are different, and they're emphasised in Islam. And this is traditional morality, it's traditional Christian morality, it's the same in, in, in Jewish, traditional Jewish morality. Uh, and these roles are celebrated and affirmed uh, in Islam. In Western Christian thought now, they have virtually disappeared, uh, and, and women have uh, and men are seen as equal and interchangeable in in the same in in the, they are the same in essence, and so women uh, the birth rate in the West is plummeting because women are not having babies, uh, and um, and that has economic repercussions for pensions. Uh, it, it means the children are often neglected at home and so on. So um, so I just wanted to emphasise here the New Testament teaching one significant strand of New Testament teaching that emphasizes the subordination of women and that they should remain silent and not speak. So I agree with Paul Williams there that uh, Western Christians have abandoned what actually the Bible is actually teaching about the role of men and women. Um, but as you can see looking at David Wood's video Paul Williams doesn't have a leg to stand on when it comes to um, understanding women and men's roles so i hope that's been a blessing to you and we'll go on to the next video